This episode is brought to you by Indie Film Hustle Academy, where filmmakers and screenwriters go to learn from top Hollywood industry professionals. Learn more at ifhacademy.com. I'd like to welcome to the show, Errol Avelino. How you doing, Errol? I'm doing good. How you doing, Alex? I'm doing good, brother. I'm doing good, man. Thanks for, for reaching out because this is going to be a very interesting conversation. I, 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 I've had other conversations about NFTs on the show before and kind of were like one of the first shows to even discuss NFTs as a way to generate revenue, sell collectibles, things like that. But you have a very unique way of approaching NFTs and we're going to get into that uh, in a second. But uh, in our before we started talking or before we started recording, uh, you told me that you have been in the indie film world. You come from the indie film yeah. world. So tell me how you got involved in the indie film world and why in God's Green Earth did you were you in the indie film world? <laughs> so good question. Um, so when I got out of high school, like literally from high school, I knew I wanted to be an indie filmmaker. Like that was the dream. Uh, cause I had a teacher who was a major film buff and, um, uh, just, you know, talking with that guy about movies just suddenly gave me this like massive appreciation for the art form. Um, storytelling, all of that really interesting to me, especially visual storytelling. So I went and, uh, I, I didn't know what the path, I said I wanted to be a filmmaker. I didn't even know that there was like a different classification of filmmaker called an indie filmmaker. I only learned that trying to just find out what the path was at all, mm -hmm. right? And it's a very clear path, right? You know, you have, you know, you go to school for four years and you do the, you know, uh, work uh, on 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 set for, for free, you know, another for free or now. nothing. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. So basically, I, I found out that there is no path. And um, I went to community college for a little bit, dropped out of that. Um, then I uh, just started finding sets to be on. Um, I, I played that game for like four years, uh, met a lot of great people. And then I started a podcast where I was still looking for, hey, how do people even make a living doing this? Because it feels like uh, it feels like everybody was just inventing it. Like I would talk to people on sets and I was like, everyone kind of just invented how they you know, made this sustainable. Um, so talking to enough people, um, I, I, I inter started interviewing people who were in just different cities and stuff like that, give them excuse to talk to me. Um, and, uh, after talking with enough people, uh, I just started to realize that the, the path is essentially just go do enough things, continue to offer yourself up to enough people. Um, and you'll, you'll start to develop what starts to look like a career, but it's always going to kind of be this like freelance uh, lifestyle. Um, and so that kind of actually started me on a journey in business, which ultimately kind of led me to where I'm at right now. But we can kind of break the story up a little bit too. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, and then you, you said you were, you were, you've been following Indie Film Hustle for a while and you, like, yeah, you were back yeah. in the olden days. Book. Oh, yeah. thank you. Yeah, man. Uh, Cause I, I, to me, the most interesting part about filmmaking um, like that has just, like even now, even though I'm not making films right now, um, and you know, it, not to say that I've stopped, right? Um, still talk about scripts with friends. You can't, you can't get rid. Still, you can't get rid of it, bro. That's like you a can't get rid of it. It's an illness. Blood, right? It's a beautiful and illness. Even what I'm doing right now has major crossover, which I've had to explain to a couple people. Like, yeah, why are you? Why are you doing? You know, the game stuff. Like, you know, is is that really gonna be? Like, you're gonna be in this for like two, three years at minimum on this game, you know, are you, are you sure you're going to be able to go that long, perhaps without making a movie? I'm like, Hey, I might still make a movie in there, but at the same time, it's not going to be like, you know, somebody else is going to have to go make that movie. I'm going to just help that person out with that movie, uh, help with the script, whatever. But anyway, so point being is, is, um, yeah, I followed your work, uh, followed a lot of the guys who have been in the, uh, the indie space, just trying to speak to, uh, people who are up and coming just because, uh, the thing that was most interesting to me about indie filmmaking is it was an art form that had to in some way be a business because it requires collaboration, perhaps more than m most other art forms, you know, save a few others that are kind of like in the media space. This is one of the like art forms that requires the most collaboration. So um, you have to have it be a business. Otherwise, you know, you can't you can't do it. You know, you think about how many times a painter punches out a painting. It's so many times. Um, but a director, how many movies does he punch out? Right. So 
Exactly. At the best case scenario, at the highest end, you got Ridley Scott who puts busts out one every three months, uh, mm-hmm. especially mm-hmm. nowadays. And then you've right, got right. and then you got Kubrick and Malick who you know busted out like nine or ten in their entire life. You right. know, right? It's, so yeah. it's it's it's. I always say that to people. Like as an artist, you uh, as a director, you very rarely get to do your art. It's, it takes years. Most yeah. of your career is getting revved up to do your art as opposed to a painter or a musician or a writer. Uh, it's it's a pretty brutal <laughs> existence, yeah. Yeah. but we love 100%. it. But we love it. That's, that's the craziness. It definitely takes a different type of person for sure. And I think that that's kind of what geared me up into wanting to do anything else that felt like that. Like I couldn't – I don't think I could ever go to – even even though business has always um, interested me, especially needing to get into it with filmmaking, I don't think I could do a business that was just you know um, trying to sell widgets, you know, oh, or yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. you know trying to do uh, some type of other service other than you know creating things for people. Yeah, I know. I completely understand. Now we're going to talk about NFTs. Can you tell people uh, listening what are NFTs if they don't know what they are already? Yeah. So I've always had this struggle with the word NFT, like just the the term, because there's very few things that we refer to by such a technical term. But literally, NFT, all it means is non-fungible token. Um, And it's very technical because all those words existed before the term non-fungible existed before. Um, But we just, you know, call this thing a non-fungible token because some developer said, you know, this makes the most sense to call it this because that's great, right? It is a non-fungible token. And basically, you've probably explained it before in other episodes, mm-hmm. but for anyone who's hearing this for the first time, uh, fungibility is literally just, um, if I have a dollar, that dollar is always the same dollar. Like, um, uh, it doesn't change in value from one dollar to another. Um, you can have any dollar and it'll always be worth the exact same. Um, you know, same thing with um, if I bought an apple, Apples are always the same value from apple to apple. Uh, so long as all things being equal, that apple is the same no matter what. But a non-fungible asset is essentially an asset of any type uh, where the, specific, the, the specificity of that asset itself is important. So, for example, a, uh, a baseball card or any collector's item um, is considered a non-fungible asset because uh, you know, when that card was minted, uh, matters, um, you know, what the what the card's overall value in the marketplace uh, matters. So the the almost the serialization of it is what really matters. Um, so you see this a lot with collector stuff, um, and I, probably collectors are some of the most familiar with non fungible assets because they've literally been dealing with these, you know, from the get go. Shoes to one person might be a fungible asset, but shoes to another person might be a non fungible asset because you know, uh, the the shoe collector is looking at, well, which uh, print was the shoe, did the shoe come from? Um, you know, what is the, you know, basically going into the specs from every single shoe, not just, you know, this particular, uh, uh, not just this particular brand, or, or even that it's a shoe. This specifically... <laughs> The, the the manufacturing line that this thing came out of. So basically an apple is an apple because an apple, uh, when it was manufactured, still had the value of an apple. And, and, we, and yes. when it was grown, it was still had a value of an apple. Whereas a baseball card, for example, or a, or a, um, a Pokemon card, um, for the for the youngins listening today, bring it back. Um, no, it's not back, man. They're they're hot now, still like they're huge now. Apparently, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's yeah, like yeah. ridiculous. Bring it back for me. Bring yeah. Back for me. <laughs> so th- those cost. Today's Pokemon anymore. Me, I mean, I don't even know. It. I didn't know then. I'm still back but, on Charmander, dude. I'm. Dude, I was garbage pill kids, man. If you want to go real back, uh, <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> I, was, I was first series garbage pill kids. Anyway, the um, but the cost of the creation of that item let's say it's five cents to to print a baseball card for just better or worse it's five cents um that is the actual value and cost of creating that uh that asset now the in the collectibles world if it's a printed if it's a printed um a baseball of a baseball card of a guy you've never heard of who batted you know 150 it costs the same to make him as it did to make a Mickey Mantle rookie card. Yep. It's the yep. exact same cost, 
but the values associated with that non-fungibility into it, which is the collectible aspect of it. And that's the right. difference between us. So that brings us to NFTs. So yeah. now we've actually brought in baseball cards and comic book ideas into a digital space. So the cost yeah. to mint, as they say, a, a non-fungible token, argue, let's say to argue, we'll say it's still five cents. But the value of what has been minted is in the eye of the beholder based on the collectible market. Fair to, 100%. For, fair way of saying the it. Reason why, the reason why I say it's bad, like it's a bad name or a bad oh, market is because uh, NFT, you, you have to do all that explaining to simply say, hey, this is actually just a, um, a, a digital item. Like this is a way for us to prove ownership of a digital item. And why that kind of matters is... Uh, we've never uh, had the ability for us to um, sell digital goods on a secondary market. Right. So it was you, impossible. If you think about it, if I buy a DVD, or sorry, if I buy a DVD, yes, I'll go down that rabbit hole. If I buy a DVD, which very pe few people do anymore, we have moved mostly digital. I can sell that DVD to uh, in a yard sale. I can sell it on Amazon. I could sell it on eBay. Like I truly own that DVD. But if I were to buy a um, the digital copy of that um, and now it's on my Amazon library, I can't sell it back to Amazon. Like I, I now have that stuck in my library. I couldn't sell it to another person. I couldn't give it to a friend. Like it is stuck in my library and it's trapped there. And, and NFTs actually give us the way to make that function more like an item. So rather rather than it being about, um, you know, uh, essentially just, you know, you once you have this digital thing and you got it from that guy. Yeah. Now it has to stay on that guy's website and you can only go to it when you go essentially to that guy's house. Um, right. That's kind of a bad deal. Right. Right. So now we're treating these like real items that you really own, which is you own it. So now now that you own it, you can go sell it to. You know, one of your buddies, you can sell it to somebody online or you can give it to them. Doesn't matter. It's yours. You do with it what you want. It's The thing is fascinating with me because when I discovered, you know, I had the same problem with the NFT name and understand it. And I'm a fairly technical and educated yeah. man. And I had to yeah. go really deep down the rabbit hole. I read probably five or 10 books on blockchain and crypto. And I really just wanted to get under, I just want to understand this new world. Right. And then NFTs came out and I just educated myself. I watched every movie I could get my documentary on as I could. So I became uh, you know, fairly well versed in this world. And yet it didn't click for me until I said, oh, this is a digital baseball card. Got it yeah. now. It's a digital comic book. Got yep. it. Because I've been, yep. a, I was a collector for a long time. Collected comic books, baseball cards, garbage trail kids since I was a kid. All that yep. kind of stuff. So I was like, oh, that's what this is. But they're they're so confusing everybody with this terminology and the way they're trying to explain them. Like, dude, it's a digital baseball card, right. and and the NBA has literally made digital clips now with NFTs and they're doing uh, they're doing okay they're doing and, and major right. league major league baseball is starting to get into it. It's a whole it's a whole new world and. For people who don't understand why, because if they if they're if you're holding on to a book or a DVD, I hold on to like okay, this is something I can hold on to. This is a product, but to mentally think about that book as a digital item, it's hard for certain people to grasp that concept because it's it's yeah. beyond their ability. Whereas the new generation growing up, who's been playing. Roblox has been playing all these role player games who are literally paying sometimes thousands of dollars for a digital axe that they now yeah. own that makes them more powerful inside of the game. That's a digital item that there's so it makes sense to that generation, but not so much to the baby boomers, if that makes sense. Sure. Yeah, yeah, because they're used to dealing in digital economies already. And so for them, it it makes for 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 most people who are um uh, you know, kind of locked into that digital economy. I mean, you, we now have a generation that's literally only dealt with digital economies. Correct. Um, and so uh, those guys, yeah, it just comes very intuitively that this makes sense. But for the rest of us, what matters the most here is that the innovation itself, there's, there's a ton of hype. There's a ton of hype, right? But the innovation itself that this is a digital item is is the massive part of the innovation, not just the, you know, um, you know, if we're trying to get all technical, like the, the non fungibility aspect, like, 
Like if we try to talk about what NFTs are, I think if we keep the conversation on that, hey, these are digital items, it starts to simplify it for everyone else. And then they can start to understand the implications or the right. implications of that. Because uh, again, like I think what made it click for even people who I know who have been in the crypto space a long time, very educated in blockchain more than I am, when I told them that what I'm trying to make is a game that when somebody buys it online, like let's say that uh, Steam is selling it, which by the way, they said they won't they won't sell it, but uh, we'll, we'll come to that. Uh, whatever version of Steam sells this game, somebody, somebody, the person who buys it should also be able to sell it themselves. And what's even more is me as the developer of that game or any indie developer who makes a game should also get a cut of every single sale of that of that item, that digital item, which is something you cannot do with a physical item. Correct. But at the same time, uh, it's now possible with the digital stuff, but every other uh, rule of what's possible with uh, the physical stuff as far as being able to do a secondary marketplace is also now finally true of digital stuff, which has been a huge um, user experience problem with the digital space um, and oh, also uh, held back a lot of indies from being able to really take advantage of their community essentially helping to market this thing because sometimes you get a movie because somebody recommended it to you or gave it to you or sold it to you or you get a game because somebody gave it to you sold it to you blah blah blah, blah. yeah i so. mean back in the day i mean and i'm dating myself when cds there used to be cd yeah. um there used to be cd stores where you could just buy new and used cds yep. and it was cutting into a lot of the market share of music and artists. And I remember Garth Brooks like sued to get yeah. to stop that. And the Supreme Court said, not nah, when you buy an item, it's yours and you can resell it. And it's just like if you bought a refrigerator, you can resell a refrigerator. A CD or a movie is no different. But in the digital space, we haven't been given that option up until this time. Like when you buy a movie on iTunes, I've got movies on iTunes. I can't resell it. I can't yeah. sell that same movie that I bought for 10 bucks for two bucks later if I want to yep. in a garage sale or in a digital version or in a metaverse garage sale uh, <laughs> or something like that, that which will happen. That's pretty dope. Yeah, yeah. Imagine if there, there will be eventually metaverse uh, metaverse uh, garage sales because there's metaverse real estate. Dude, there's people buying so much metaverse real yep. estate. It's insane. Like, and that's another thing you can't even comprehend. Like how much did you just spend? I just saw this whole thing. Was it on? I think it was on 60 Minutes or CBS or something like that, where they were doing uh, metaverse sale, real estate deals, and Snoop, Snoop Dogg bought a big piece of real estate, and then the value of the spaces next to him just blew up, and then people yeah. bought in because why? Because they want to be neighbors with Snoop Dogg in the metaverse. It was just like. Yep. It's it's yep. it's it's hard. It's really hard to grasp because it's so new and so revolutionary that people can't grab it. But we can go down the NFT and blockchain rabbit hole for at least another 15 days. So the reason I wanted to bring you on is what you've been able to do with an IP. So can you tell me how you used NFTs to launch your new IP, Strange Clan? Yeah. So so one of the things that I realized real fast, and probably most filmmakers realize this, is that nobody cares about your story because the intellectual property behind your story is brand freaking new. And that's why we don't see original ideas anymore within the film space. So um, we, me and my brother, um, both been creative guys. We, we've had a creative career for a long time, you know, uh, essentially being creative for other people. Most of our career has been creative for other people. So when we were watching kind of like the development of NFTs and, you know, how people were using them, one of the things I kept telling him, and I couldn't convince, I felt like I couldn't convince other creators of this, but one of the things I was telling him is like, hey, this is like a launch pad for intellectual property because I'm seeing bored apes now all over the place. So why... Like that's that's brand new intellectual property that if somebody were to then take that um, and now make a board ape TV show now make like now people will recognize it right um, and the value of that asset is going to go up similar to Snoop Dogg moving next door like the more um, the more things you begin to attach to these brand new uh, pieces of intellectual property the more it starts to get really interesting but I wasn't seeing projects do that I was just essentially seeing a ton of like 
you know, spammy looking, um, uh, you know, images uh, come out with no vision of like where it was supposed to go after this. So we started talking about, well, what would it look like if we did um, a uh, an NFT launch um, and where would we do it and um, and all that stuff? Because Ethereum, uh, the too many problems with Ethereum, uh, it the, the um, there's a there's lots of different reasons why there's a problem um, with Ethereum, but um, uh, one of them being that you if you bought something for a hundred bucks, you might spend two hundred dollars in fees. Um, mm. So that's kind of an issue. Um, plus, also the that area is very saturated. So we looked at several places to to try to do this, and and that was a huge factor into it. And I'll get into that. But basically what we wanted to do was we wanted to create something brand new, completely unique, and we wanted it to be something that was unique the second you saw it. So we came up with this idea for Strange Clan because we had a guy on our team. Um, he's a concept artist for us, and, and he really leads art for um, for our, our team as a whole, and we've started to really grow out our art team underneath of him. Um, and um, he, we just said, hey, man, like um, we're, this is totally exploratory. Like We really want to try to do something um, here, uh, come up with some images and we want to do like animals. Uh, we want to do animals that look like people. Um, and, um, uh, we want this to be like kind of a fantasy esque, uh, thing, but we also want it to look really, um, uh, like, uh, lots of different styles present in it. Um, and me and my brother did a, uh, we did a talk, uh, together just essentially like every single day we kind of have this where we're balancing ideas back and forth. And the, one of the big conversations was, well, what's the name going to be? Um, and because we kept talking about having like, well, lots of different, uh, uh, lots of different uh, looks and styles and feels, kind of at the start of it, um, uh, we we had this feeling of like, well, it's really it's really a, just a strange group of people. Because originally the idea was actually that we were going to pull in more artists, um, so we wanted the style of our characters to look really um, wild for mm-hmm. a second. So that uh, other strange-looking styles uh, that came in would also match up. Um, and the more we looked at the idea of actually collaborating with other artists, the more we realized we were. It was it was mainly for us to do kind of a community thing where all of our IPs sort of all come up, and maybe we do something where we try to make sense of why they're all connected. Um, but uh, it actually turned out that our IP took off, and we really didn't need to like pull in other IPs to make that work. So. Uh, going back to it, we came up with this idea of strange clan. We said, "Hey, it's a clan. It's a family. It's a it's a it's a tight knit group of people, and there's kind of a strange environment about the world." Um, and the more that we let that idea play, uh, the more the um, so you'll see over the last several months of like uh, art development um, on our social channels, that idea has grown into a much more mature IP. But at the very beginning, at the launch of these NFTs. This looks like really raw, like the beginning development of what even this IP is supposed to supposed to be. And that's what's strange about the the NFT world and the way that people are treating these, because um, it's almost as if they are looking to the future of what it's supposed to be. Very similar to how people treat Kickstarters. But instead of it being, you know, all about um, getting a T-shirt or, you know, getting a hat or getting a copy of the movie. Instead, they're they're taking the messy artwork that you're producing, or or the things that you're producing, and eventually they'll have to get more mature over time as as people get used to seeing a lot of the same styles, right? But uh, they're looking at that and they're looking ahead and saying, okay, how uh, important is it going to be that this uh, uh, how, the, with the vision of where the creators are going, how important is it going to be that I own a piece of this intellectual property, that I own a piece of Um, of the starting launch point, like the first Pokemon card, as it were. Like if Pokemon cards came first and launched that IP, it certainly launched it in the US, but if Pokemon came first, Pokemon cards came first and really launched that IP, this is like the Pokemon card and owning the first Pokemon card, especially if projects do it right, because that's kind of what we're trying to say is we're only ever going to do 10,000 of these. Only ever going to do 10,000 of these. So immediately that sets the value of all right, if we're successful with making a great looking game, then the collector's uh, 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 cards that we're making at this side of things will always be very rare uh, and always have value on a secondary marketplace. You were going to say something. So, yeah, it's kind of like uh, if you would have owned the NFTs of the original concept art of Star Wars. Yeah. 
Yep. If that exactly. if that would have been a thing, if George was trying to get things off the ground and there was a studio and this was an environment, and he had those those awesome I don't know ten or twenty paintings. Yep. Uh, yep. And put those out on NFT. What would the value of that be based off the, the massive IP yeah. that is Star Wars? Um, yeah. So so, yeah. so similar, you're doing that similar for a game, but easily this can be translated into uh, a film as well if yep. it's properly. So, okay, so you, you also told me that you raised a substantial amount of money. How much did you raise yeah. with this NFT and this, uh, launching this IP? So we've only launched 5,000 of the 10,000 NFTs. Mm -hmm. And with that fi those 5,000 NFTs, we raised $2 million. So like every other independent film, basically. So every other independent yeah, film yeah, makes yeah, generally yeah, yeah. easily, yeah. easily can raise $2 million. Typical. <laughs> yeah, super easy to also raise that money for an independent game with uh, unknown developers. <laughs> Um, you know, they, those, those usually get about $2 million. So, so uh, if, if you're not, if you don't, uh, understand this is sarcasm, uh, this is extremely, yes. if, uh, people, so people might be listening like, Oh, it's that easy. Am I doing something wrong? No, you're not. Yeah. It is extremely difficult to raise $2 million in any space under any circumstances. Uh, uh -huh. but for an independent game from unknowns is, is the equivalent of trying to raise $2 million for an, uh, an independent film with unknown actors, with unknown filmmakers, with unknown producers and everybody else involved as well. So that is a feat that caught my eye when you when you reached out to me. How did you well first of all, how did you because look man, I could I could yeah. tomorrow, I, tomorrow I can come up with some strange pictures and some cool characters which there are billions of out there right now and especially in the mm -hmm. NFT space. How did you target the audience and convince yeah. the audience on your vision? That was you were able to, and you did this fairly quickly. This was not like over five years. Yeah, we're talking about two, two to three months worth of time for the even the lead up to it. So uh, if I were to chart the timeline, we came up with the idea in uh, it, the 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 conversation. Well, between me and my brother, we're like, oh hey, wouldn't this be a great idea around July time? All right, and then in, of last year, uh, of last year, of this past year. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Twenty twenty one. Um, and then uh, in uh, August was when we started some of the art. We opened up the Twitter in September, and I believe one of our first posts um, on the Strange Clan Twitter was September, like early September, September 1st, September 2nd, like with literally within the first week. Um, and then uh, September, October, October, October 15th, it was when uh, we launched. We launched the first time, and we actually broke our website, so we actually had to launch again. We were, we were open for less than an hour, probably 30 minutes, and we broke the website. We we took a, a week to so, fix a lot of the problems. All right, so stop for yeah. a second. How did you generate enough interest to break a website mm -hmm. from an unknown IP and unknown creators? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No ad spend. Right. No, like, so how, literally so how did like, So how did they find out about it? How did, yep. what was, how did you target yep. your audience? Yeah. Yeah, so I've, I've, this is really hard for me to like, um, this is really hard for me to also then make sense of with a lot of the things that I have told people and I have also thought myself, but the people who came on were solely people interested in the technology more than they were interested in the IP. And because we were supporting the technology of what they were doing, the IP became important to them. So we grabbed onto a neighboring thing that they cared a lot about. And then the IP became important. Okay. So let me just get specific. So the um, the place that we chose to build on uh, is Cosmos. So what for people who don't know, mm -hmm. you know, you have Bitcoin, you have Ethereum, uh, you have Polkadot, you have Cardano. Well, Cosmos is within like the top 25 uh, blockchains, uh, and the re and nobody was doing NFTs on Cosmos. The reason why we said that we needed to go to Cosmos was one, it was actually it was a blue ocean, and I think you've talked about blue oceans before. Oh yeah. Um, yep. Yep. It's a blue ocean. There's not there's not a lot of people who are over there. But then also very different from other um, uh, blockchains um, was Cosmos reminded me of where the ball is going versus where everybody is paying attention to the ball right now because Cosmos is not all these all these blockchains Bitcoin Ethereum they're what are called layer ones where basically this is the blockchain. Like if you want to build on it, you're basically saying, okay, I'm going to try to take a piece of this. I do a little copy code and try to make a weird little copy of it that borrows security, 
borrows a lot of different features from this thing, but it's also kind of like a Frankenstein mm -hmm. off of the uh, the original blockchain because blockchains were not meant to build these Frankenstein uh, blockchains off of them. Um, so what Cosmos is, is it's basically the internet of blockchains. It's not really a layer one blockchain. It is a thing that you build blockchains on because it was meant for that. If you think about Bluetooth and how your phone can connect so seamlessly to your Bluetooth headphones, um, even though they are made by completely different people, um, the reason is because there's a standard that says, oh, every time Bluetooth, every time we're trying to enable Bluetooth, this is the standard for Bluetooth, and this is how we're going to make this connection. So where I saw the ball going and where my brother, Lex, honestly, here, I'm going to actually give all the credit to Lex. Says, I, Lex easily proved the idea to me. He said, Errol, I think Cosmos is the place to pay attention to because of interoperability. There's a lot of smart people over there who are doing some really cool stuff. Um, and he was basically telling me like this concept of Bluetooth. I got it really quick because I was like, the way that this is going reminds me a lot of the dot-com boom. Um, and the way that we saw the internet develop was you had all these disconnected websites. Uh, but even before that, just creating the standard of, you know, the internet as a whole right. was important to even get to that place. And then things have become more and more connected as we have progressed. So much so that I can log into a website using my Facebook login, right? So as we develop these standards, the standard is going to be what's really important. So I saw Cosmos as, hey, they are setting the standard. And so if we build here, we actually should be able to connect to anybody else in the, in the uh, blockchain world. So if we build here, we might not ever have to build anywhere else again. The people who are in the Cosmos space, they're, they are – oh, and also it's green. Like I, I, and this is important to I think a lot of people. It's green. We're not dealing with a lot of high energy usage. Um, you, uh, you also have, um, uh, the, uh, the community as a whole is actually very positive. I, 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 I like that about them right away. Um, but anyway, so the community that's there, they believe in this idea that this is going to be the internet of blockchains. Everybody, all the blockchains that are out there are going to try to conform to the standard because they're talking about it now. And ultimately that standard has to happen. And this is the only blockchain that's really said, Hey, we're setting the standard. This is what the standard is. You know, go out and make your blockchains. Does it? Does does Cosmos have a token, or is it? Is it, does it have a crypto? Ver so, uh, uh, how do, how, do, yeah, how do you so how do you work with that? Yeah. So Cosmos itself is is the standard. There is what's called Cosmos Hub, which is essentially the first blockchain built on this Cosmos standard. So if you want to think about it like, hey, this is the web. Well, what if the you know internet said, hey. We're going to make the very first website is Internet Hub, right? It's like HTTP. It's HTTP, basically. Yeah, it's like yep. that's Yeah, yep. yeah, I got so it. So Cosmos Hub has a coin. It's called Atom. It's available on Coinbase. It, it's, it's a way to get your dollars into the whole How uh, much is Cosmos it right now? Ecosystem. How much is it right now? Uh, I think it's like 20, 27. It hangs around about $30. So, Interesting. Um, and so at the time, uh, we when we launched our NFTs, um, we actually had to do a lot of the blockchain development. We had to we had to find guys who could, you know, do uh, the blockchain development, which is actually becoming easier and easier. Um, so that part's actually not terribly hard. Um, and the people who are coming into the Cosmos space now, including us, are helping you know essentially set up marketplaces so that it's easy for people to make uh, 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 make NFTs and mint NFTs uh, without having to go and build you know essentially your own blockchains. Um, stuff like Juno, stuff like uh, Stargaze, um, and then us. So. so, so all right. So, just so I can, I'll, I'll kind of translate that for everybody, and because there's, there's a lot though you discussed there. So yeah. basically, one of the the, the the big pluses you did is you decided to leverage a community that existed already, which is the Cosmos 100%. community. And yeah. by leveraging that that community, it wasn't particularly ready for you. But it mm -hmm. was ready for you because there was yeah. nobody else doing what you were doing in that community. So then you built a product in that community, which is your I IP. You was like, let's yep. put it over here. And they're just like, oh, my God, you're over you're over in our party. We're going to support you purely because you decided not to 100%. go to the cool kids party. You came over yeah. to us because we're we're cool, but nobody really knows that we're cool. And that's how, yeah. and, and you kind of leveraged that. And that's what built the speed up so fast. Uh, as yep. opposed to you going to a general marketplace, uh, right. it, so the equivalent. So this would be projects. Well, just before I lose my train of thought, 
it's the equivalent of you trying to sell a movie about um, aging athletes. Uh, let's say there's a, I'm using this as an exact example. There was a documentary about aging athletes uh, that are athletes who are, you know, centurions and they like go to the Olympics instead. Uh, now, if you put that into the iTunes marketplace, you might sell some. But if you head over to a convention that is aimed at um, retirement homes and they're looking for entertainment, you're going to clean up. And that's exactly what that filmmaker did. They made over a million dollars in a weekend by selling rights to his movie. That's what you basically did with this. Is that a fair, yep. a fair analogy? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that, that's, a, that's exactly right because um, the community so, – so the way that we also built our audience up because we have about – 20,000 people in our audience, which, you know, pretty decent for only being around for, you know, five, uh, five months or Absolutely. so. Absolutely. Um, and, um, the, the way that we kind of made that happen is, you know, we went and engaged with the people who were already talking to people in the Cosmos space. We talked with the influencers, which is a big, it's that, that's a, that's a word that's probably a little flexible here because literally they only had like 2000 followers or 3000 followers. But that starts to add up over time. And then you start to talk to more people or get to know more people who have actually a lot of influence in the space that seems actually pretty subtle because they don't necessarily have the follower count that makes you think that. But they know all the guys because they've been around for you know years um, and everybody respects them in the space. And the second right. and they can give you an introduction to the guy who actually has you know, 20,000, 30,000 or 50,000 followers. Right. Right. And that's so a, most so of you leveraging, have, you were leveraging the influencers inside of the community to get the word out on your new IP and your new, basically 100%. everything you were doing. See, I mean, 100%. so, so that, so you know, ad spend. So everyone listening, no ad spend. It's just understanding the community and then going after influencers in that community. And now when you go in after them, did the influencers just were very happy? They're like, dude, I'm just, I want to support you because this is cool. Or did you have to like, Hey, yeah, I want a piece of the action. How is it? How does that work generally? Oh, dude, a hundred percent there. They came in. They're like, Hey, I, this is cool because the, the thing about, thing about uh, a lot of these very connected ecosystems is um, they have many ways to win without needing to say, yeah, I need a piece of the action. Um, because if, uh, let's say you launch an NFT collection um, and uh, they know about it, like one, they can they have more time to be able to convince you. Maybe they, they can get on the whitelist. Um, so whitelist, by the way, within the NFT world is just essentially like, hey, you – you uh, not everybody's going to get the chance to even buy this thing. Um, and uh, we're making sure that you're on the list to be able to even get in to buy it. So there's a lot of exclusivity there. Um, so we can make sure we get them on the white list and certain things like that. But at the same time, um, there isn't a there isn't a uh, agreement essentially that like, hey, you know, you do this for me. I do this for you. It's really trying to develop that relationship with them, because when we talk to a lot of these guys, it was. You know, hey, we love what Cosmos is doing. We want to make sure that uh, we are supporting that ecosystem um, and adding a lot of value to it. So they're all about that because, you know, when you're an influencer in a very tight uh, arena, mm -hmm. um, it feels like uh, pulling teeth to get people to even notice this space that you're talking a ton about. Whereas, you know, somebody comes just comes to you and says, hey, already love what you guys are doing. I want to come in and support that. Um, I want to bring my project into that. That gets people really excited. And there, just so you guys know, this isn't a ship that's like sail. Like if you're listening to this. Oh, um, it's so early. You know, <laughs> we're so we're, we're extremely early. Even you don't have to go find your own cosmos. If you were to bring a project into cosmos right now, the community within cosmos is extremely hungry. Um, you can't be a prick. So don't go in and be like, all right, guys, I thought there was a lot of money in here. So fork it up. Um, but at the same time, there's way more opportunity than you're probably used to in most other avenues because I've tried to launch projects on Kickstarter, I, uh, like Indiegogo. It's, I've it's, had to ask for investment money. Um, I've raised a uh, uh, hundred grand on Kickstarter and I felt really good about that one time. Um, and I raised uh, or I was a part of the raise for 200 grand 
on a, uh, but it was all investment money. It was coming into this film, um, and it was just like pulling teeth. It was an absolute nightmare. Launching Strange Clan was one of the easiest things I've ever done, and that was the most amount of money that we have ever seen, especially for a brand new IP. Now, um, yeah, it's it's the equivalent of being on MySpace in the early days or being on Facebook in the early days or being on YouTube in the yeah. early days. I interviewed a bunch of guys who were on, on YouTube early on, and it was so early that they were like able to figure out. Yeah, they, I mean, I was on, I was, I was there in 2005. And I just stopped, and I Ooh. wish I could have kept going. And that's a whole other. Co- I actually have minted NFTs of the very. Fir- I have the. I have the privilege of and the honor of being the first filmmaking tutorials ever on YouTube. I have. Yeah. I and I minted those NFTs, and they sold out like that because I did only that's one-offs awesome. on them. Uh, but the thing is that uh, early on, if you're in in a platform early on, there's things that you'll be able to do there that in a few years you won't be able to do. So like I, I interviewed yes. some, uh, I interviewed the rocket jump guys uh, who were very big in the filmmaking, like showing you how to tutorials Freddy. and stuff like that. But they, Freddie and those guys, they started in like 2011, 2010. And yeah. even then they, they were like, Oh yeah, man, we figured out how to hack the front page. So we would do stuff to get ourselves on the front page. And that's how they got to like 11 million followers <laughs> over the right. Right. But you can't do that now. Like that's that's gone, yeah. you know, but yeah. but that's kind of like what you're able to do here well, because it's just so fresh. Into a Blue Ocean too, because like yep. when, when they came in, uh, they were doing something different that you hadn't seen yet on right. YouTube. And so even though it was not day one for YouTube, it was still new for the platform. So if you even as the space uh, within Cosmos or any one of these marketplaces starts to fill up, there's a lot of new things that you can bring in to these mm-hmm. spaces, um, especially when you think about, you know, well, who is it that I'm that I'm talking to that that needs to buy into this? And I would just start that exploration because we had no idea whether or not this was going to do well. It was all exploration, all trying to say, you know, all right, um, uh, let's just have this conversation with them. You know, let's continue to paint our vision. Um, but our vision, it was always for that for that. Uh, two, three months, our vision was always kind of like only about a month out really for what we were like really trying to plan. And so everything was, you know, making decisions on the spot, really trying to cultivate, you know, what is it that we're, we're ultimately trying to bring to this and listen to people when they said, Hey, I love what you're doing. I, I think that if you just did this over here, um, so for example, we didn't even consider the idea of trying to launch our own token because none of us were like particularly blockchain developers. Um, we just happened to have some people who had a gist of it. Um, uh, we had no concept of launching our token. People convinced us to do it and now we're about to do it. And that's a much bigger money raise for the the stuff that we're trying to build. Cause now we're getting way more ambitious as far as like the, the types of things that we're trying to take on, um, yeah, there's actually multiple, I, multiple, that, multiple yeah. IPs, multiple everything. All right, so yeah. if you were going to go into the Cosmos space right now, yeah, with an independent film project, mm-hmm. how would you go about it? Yeah, so for me, I would try to pick something that you could actually carry on because there's a difference between, um, you know, uh, like for example, you know, you have the 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 point about the like retired athletes, right? Um, if you're looking at that project and you're saying like, yeah, I just want to do like this one off thing, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't know. That's a, a great place to start. I would say if you if you're wanting to do that project, think more like the um, uh, the toys that made us or um, like brand like IPs that actually have, you know, uh, longevity to them. Because when you think about the toys that made us, that's something that could go on for a long time and, and continue to go on and have a life so, of its own. So you wouldn't say, so let's say I just want to do, I want, I'm going to create an IP. Um, I have a, I have, a, I'm, I'm not doing this by the way. So everyone's like, Alex is fishing. I'm not going to do this, but, um, okay. I have a, I have a short film, uh, called Red Princess Blues. It's an entire universe that I created, uh, years oh, ago. Yeah. 
and I, I created an animated short film prequel of it. I created a, a, a full length, you know, had some Oscar winner, Oscar nominees in it. It was a big IP. It, it, it was an IP that yeah. I was trying to launch back in 2010 before any of this that happened. Yeah. Now, Sounds if, cool though. it is, no, it is a pretty, it's a pretty badass. It's a pretty badass uh, idea. <laughs> uh, but um, if I would bring this to them and go, look, guys, I want to make a feature film of this. Uh, yeah. I need $2 million uh, to generate revenue. I've got this person involved and this person involved and this person involved. And I've already packaged a nice, you know, I've got this actor who's thinking uh, this actor is committed. This actor's committed. I've got this Oscar winning producer on. I've got this Oscar winning screenwriter yeah. on, you know, and I create a really cool package and yeah. go, how would you approach that? I'm not doing yeah. this, by the way, so no one email me. But <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just using it as an nice. example. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So um, the I, I use the I use the example of the uh, toys that made us thing because I there's probably somebody out there who's like um, uh, maybe oh well I'm not I'm not a fantasy guy or I'm not trying to tell like fiction stories like that's fine you can tell like real stories but there's a way to frame it so that it's actually a unique IP versus like the toys that made us create a brand right mm -hmm. and now they've created a brand that's all about idealizing you know brands from the past that's cool there's something about that right um but for yours it's that's easy to talk about right mm -hmm. okay so step one you got to be on twitter if you're not on twitter then you're not talking to the community um especially when we talk about cosmos but really all of uh crypto uh talk and discussion and and where the real influences are like that's Twitter. Um, I was not a Twitter guy for the longest time because I freaking hate like the um, tweeting. Uh, you hate tweeting. I hate tweeting. It's just <laughs> it's, it's just obnoxious. Um, so the um, uh, the problem uh, with well, okay. So go to Twitter first, mm -hmm. and then when you talk about this package, to me that's that's your roadmap, right? Um, and everybody understands like every project needs a roadmap because if all this is going to be is just uh, uh, an image that lives on a marketplace, then uh, all those uh, you know right click uh, copy guys, you know those guys are all right. They're correct, which basically is like there's a whole argument to um, well, it's just a freaking image or a JPEG. You know, if I copy this and then I go mint this on the same place that you did, what's the difference between yours and mine? Well, ultimately, if you have this roadmap laid out, yours is the only one who's going to accomplish the roadmap. Ideas are worthless unless there's actually the ability to back them up. And that's what that roadmap is all about. The roadmap says, all right, I'm not just going to um, uh, make these images. I'm bringing on these actors. I've got this plan for where this is going. So mine is valuable because mine has all these things versus yours, which is just a copy of mine. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, so I would say that uh, step one is go on Twitter. Step two is people are going to start asking you, okay, Discord. What, what's the Discord? You want to go follow the people who are following uh, influencers within the blockchain that you're trying to build on. I would obviously push towards Cosmos because I think that's one of the greatest communities that's out there as far as crypto goes. Um, and um, uh, you want to go follow the people who are, are talking about projects, especially ones that are in the NFT world. Uh, because the people who are looking at those, they not only want to support the ecosystem, but they also believe in the power of NFTs and what, what that technology is bringing to the ecosystem, um, which is most of the guys, to be honest, so you're rarely going to miss. Um, then from there, um, it's all about, uh, one, continuing the dialogue with the community as far as like, you know, uh, this is what we're doing to lead up to the launch. Uh, these are the conversations that we're having. Um, I ha we have somebody hired on our team who um, literally her only job is to every single day have coffee in the morning with our community, answer questions, um, and then um, uh, tweet out uh, updates and uh, you know post Discord updates, you know all that stuff. So there's a whole process of engaging with community while you're going through this development process. But then um, leading up to the launch of just the NFTs, that first like two months, let's say, um, it's you know make the artwork, uh, be posting little bits of the artwork. Uh, find ways to collaborate with the influencers, doing giveaways, uh, potentially giving people whitelist spots on uh, onto um, your uh, uh, NFT launch. Um, and um, I, I mean, all these are very like community engagement oriented things. But that's that's 
that's where that, that's where I would lay the groundwork. That's where I would say that that's the that's the foundation point of it. And then from there you launch, and then you would launch NFTs. Uh, so when you say NFT, so because it's such a broad term, uh, when you raised money for your IP, were you selling collectibles or were you selling pieces mm. of the? Uh, were you selling pieces yeah, yeah. Of, of, so, of, of 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 the IP? Are, are they yeah, owners? Yeah. How does that work? Okay, okay, okay. So uh, we were selling images of the characters that would be in the game, and these would all be characters that were playable uh, in the game. Our main goal was when we when we were trying to launch this IP was one we wanted to we wanted to be able to make a game. There were several reasons for that because we were actually working on a project that could um, uh, essentially uh, be a, a, a form of a metaverse project. Everyone started calling it a metaverse. We called it a virtual event platform, mm-hmm. um, and um, uh, we wanted something that we could show like, Hey, this is the power and the complexity of what this thing can actually do. But we want it to be very like, um, uh, customer focused. So we're like, let's build a game on this thing because if we build a game on this thing, I think that people will, people will come to the game, not knowing at all what we're doing. And then they'll be attracted to what it is that we're doing with this platform. So the game itself was kind of like always part of the plan. So when we priced out what our NFTs were going to cost, one, we knew they were going to be the playable characters, so that was always from the okay, get-go. Okay, got it. We made a ton of artwork around what the char- playable characters were, um, and then I've been by the way, I've been mentoring another guy who mentoring is a mentoring is a big word. Uh, I would I would say that I've been talking with a good friend of mine who has a pretty big audience that he wants to launch an NFT collection to, um, and I've been giving him this same counsel, like you know these should be playable characters or these should be access points you know, into um, a community, depending on whether or not he wants to go down the route of making so, a game or whether or not he wants to, you know, give people access to just a community. So in other words, I would, if I would do Red Princess Blues, I would actually introduce my main character or multiple characters. I could create NFTs that were playable inside of Strange Clan or another community sure. as a as a way to generate revenue if we wanted yeah. to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even though it's based on yeah. a movie, it's just using those NFTs inside of War, yeah, World or, of Warcraft or any other or metaverse like that. project. Because because right. that's the other thing too is so long as somebody's building something on on the same thing that you are building, there's ways to make connection points to that. But even the easiest thing, because this does not take a lot of money to do, um, is uh, creating a community that only people with these NFTs get access to. The whole Board Ape Yacht Club. The reason why people spend like half a million dollars Got on Board Ape Yacht Club is because it is a access card into a private community, and if you don't have that access card, you don't get in. It doesn't matter how many times you try to copy that NFT and mint it yourself, it does not matter. You cannot get into this community unless you have that NFT. So would you would you like be doing, you know, concept art, character art as yes. NFTs? Um, would you character would, art, concept art, I love all, all, those all that all that you know, is, you could you could do, you know, anything. You could do a thousand different kinds of NFTs and you can mint uh, you know, a hundred of them, you can mint one of them, you can mint 500 of them, it depends on how you want to do it and, and price them accordingly. But for an unknown IP, but because I've seen this, I, I've talked to other filmmakers who've, who've gone on to like the main NFT platforms and they mm-hmm. made a little bit of money with it. And some of them have sold their distribution rights through NFTs and, you know, all of that wow. whole, whole nice. all of that world. But it's so early on; it's hard to even fathom how that yeah. is, is going to work. So like you're well, on the- and I would say that I would say that there's you're not gonna you're probably not gonna make too many mistakes here in the beginning because we don't even know what the mistakes are. So, it's the so, it's, it's it's the internet 1997, man. That's where we are. Yes, 100, 100. percent So what what I would say is is um uh there's two, there's there's a few big things to watch out for. If you're going down this space, there's a few big things to watch out for. One is um, creating something that ultimately has absolutely no utility whatsoever and you don't put any kind of utility into the plan. Like, honestly, I would just say from the get-go, say this is going to be at access point into a private community. At least have that. And then when you do your agreements and stuff with actors and stuff, you know, I would say try to pull those guys into the private community at least for, uh, um, you know. A time period. Uh, Q&A, like, yeah. stuff like that. Like, there, that should be part of the agreement. Um the second thing is, is um, you have to watch out for language that uh, insinuates, unless you're ready to do this, uh, insinuates that this is going to be um, a, a security. 
So this is what we're yeah, dealing with yeah, right be, now. Yeah, you got to be real careful with that stuff. Yeah, yeah. This is what we're dealing with right now because we're now talking about wanting our, – our NFTs are totally safe. Now we're talking about um, – uh, Creating a token. never offered any like um, uh, uh, profits and stuff if you own the NFTs or anything like that. The, uh, the main thing that we told people was this is what we're building. This is going to be the starting price. You know, the, we never speculated on what the future price could be. We let other people speculate on that. Um, and, um, but the second you say that, Hey, you're going to have the profits from X, which a lot of people, even Gary V has been like, you know, Hey, uh, if you, uh, if you're a music guy, um, if you make an NFT, if you make your song into an NFT and then just shared all your profits from that, you know, uh, you could make, you can make a ton of money doing that. Yes. If you're also ready to, you know, make an agreement with the SEC and label this as a security, which you can totally do. They're down with it. They'll let you do that. The only issue is, is are you ready to go hire that lawyer? You can, and you can do it in the reverse and you can, and by the way, this is not legal advice, this is not financial advice. Yeah, of course not, of course. Yeah, 100%, 100% entertainment, this is just my opinion. But what you can do is you can say, um, uh, uh, I'm going to uh, launch this project, we are gonna share the profits, um, and uh, you build into your pricing and your budget, like whatever the price is that you're gonna sell each individual NFT at, with the understanding that you're going to pay for the lawyer who's going to help set you up with the SEC to be able to do this legally. Man, this is man, we are in the wild wild west right now. It is it is crazy even in the short time that I've been talking about NFTs uh and blockchain and crypto and all of the stuff that we've been able to talk to about on the show, it's changed dramatically. Someone like yourself comes on and does what they do. Man, it's just like I mean, I, I had a website in 98. I remember what mm. it was like. I mean, I was making $6,000 a month back in 90, yeah, yeah. 97, but it, unfortunately my server bills were $6,000 a month. So it really, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it didn't really the cost. Pr- the, the price of things goes up. The price of things goes down as development continues. It's yeah, crazy, man. It is. So it, I, I remember the wild, wild west of that time. And like nobody even, you know, I remember Flash. Like everyone's like, oh, yeah. Flash is the future. <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, yeah. it's like, so, so many things are, are in flux right now. And there is opportunities just like there was in the wild, wild west to, you know, put a stake in the land that might be yeah. worth worthless now. But, oh, it, you know, I, I was um, I was in California and I went to Hearst Castle up in northern California mm-hmm. where, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the guy that they built, they uh, based Citizen Kane on. Yeah. Uh, but he bought mountainside real estate on the ocean, 19 cents an acre. Wow. Nineteen. He owns, I think, about like ten or twenty thousand acres yeah. on the ocean in Northern California. That's insane. But that was well, the wild, wild west of the time. Like, if you could mm-hmm. afford to buy totally. nineteen cents of an, to buy an acre, you yep. could you could buy it. So yep. Other people were buying other things, uh, but they. Yeah. So it's the exact same thing. We're here, but now we're in the digital world where real estate yeah. and NFTs and you know, crypto and all this kind of stuff. It's still very volatile and still very crazy. Yeah. Uh, but but the it is the future is more of the more of the things that um, you want to see happen. Like, honestly, it's a good thing that we have regulators who are now taking this yes. seriously. Because Agreed. What they are saying is, is um, in, in a lot of ways, they're saying that what is happening is legal. We're just trying to figure out how to treat it. Um, and so uh, <laughs> like the Internet, that, so for example, like the Internet, things like yeah, you, you have things like regulators. I mean, literally, so this is what we're dealing with is we talk to our lawyer um, probably three times a week. Um, and every time we do a conversation with him, um, not only do we get an update on how things are going with us setting up some of the regulatory needs, because there's very there's a reality in which we, if in order for us to launch the token that we're planning to launch, um, we will have to be, um, uh, we will have to be a security. There's a reality in which that happens. Um, and so, um, the crazy part is though, is that every single week we have a new update about what the government is still figuring out about whether they want to treat it as a security or what they even consider to be a security when it comes to uh, crypto and there's constant pushback. So we're literally at the bleeding edge of a lot of this stuff, like you're saying. Um, and so when it comes to, uh, when it comes to some of the unknown unknowns, there's a lot of potential upside. Um, you just also have to um, prepare for 
um, the very worst case scenario. And and that's something that we just knew going in was yes, we're gonna we're gonna have a um, a lot of money suddenly come in, but then how do we also protect our butts um, when while the government is still trying to decide how things are supposed to uh, go? So always back to that something. <laughs> it is it is a crazy wacky world that we're going into, and man, I can't see. I honestly can't see. <coughs> excuse me a a future in the next ten or fifteen years that doesn't have this stuff. Uh, I mean, regarding ingrained in our not only society but specifically in the film industry, it is the future. I think people will start demanding uh, fungible uh, copies of their movies and music that they can resell in a secondary marketplace. That will yeah. become a thing uh, in yeah. the future. No, no question, because it's just people will start demanding it and. And then films yep. will start, you know, a studio will, one studio will do it. The studio that's the scrappy one in the corner, like Canon Films back in the day. Yeah. I don't know if anyone listening, I just did a, an episode uh, with one of the founding guys from Canon, who was one of the directors there. He, he basically, he directed American Ninja. So uh, back in the day. And he was telling me, he's like, the reason why Canon blew up in the 80s was because the studios were scared to get into VHS. So because no studio wanted to put their movies up on VHS, there were all these video stores opening up across the country that needed content, needed product. So all the independents started coming in and that's when you had, you know, not the Terminator, but the Exterminator and yeah. all these other yeah. B movies. Yep. But they made so much money. I mean, the American Ninja IP was massive around the world. And then after the studio it's like, whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait a minute. We're, we can't let these guys make all this money. And then yeah. the studio showed up and they started throwing their yeah. weight around. So that's what's going to happen here too. Right now, everyone's dipping their toes. Look, Quentin Tarantino just dipped his toes into NFTs and, mm -hmm. and got his hand slapped. I do, yeah. I'm, on, I'm on team Tarantino on this because uh, I think he does have the right to do whatever the hell he wants to do with that. Um, but yeah, yeah. It's, but I, I, I even said it on the show. I'm like, imagine if Tarantino bust out an yeah. nft like who would, listens man you know yeah, okay, well then if you're listening he, Quentin, he was like hey I, that sounds like a great idea if someone from quinn's team is listening can you come on the show brother i would really appreciate it i'd love to talk to you so, so with tarantino <laughs> did he actually try to like tokenize each of the frames of the no no not no 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 not frames original copies of the script and That's he had nice. an audio commentary explaining why he wrote some scenes like complete original and you know nft but then uh the company miramax sued him because they're like oh no we own the copyright to mm. the pulp fiction trademark and and the script that we That's purchased tough. and they're like so now you're like well wait a minute this is a one this is art and this is a one-off we're not mass produced like there's a whole thing so yeah. it's a really interesting conversation to be had but like i always said imagine if you know if george lucas busted out an nft for star wars back in the day or Raiders of the Lost Ark or any of the Spielberg's movies or any of Cameron's movies yeah. or any of that kind of stuff. You know, it's, it's only a matter of time before we have the Avatar NFTs, you know, yeah. that have, yep. you know, James talking through it and there's two of them. Yeah. Is that going to be valuable? It's same way a Mickey Mantle rookie card is valuable, man, or a Babe Ruth card is valuable is because there's 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 scarcity of it and so on and so forth. But again, dude, we could keep talking for hours, brother. I really appreciate you uh, coming on the show and explaining your process on how you were able to raise $2 million for a brand new IP. It is a really interesting way of looking at how to raise money for independent films, especially in a, in a world that it is getting tougher and tougher for independent films to get financed. Is yeah. this going to be for every project? Probably not, but yeah, can it yep. be, but can it be, can it be, you know, framed in a way like that could sell in a cosmos or an Ethereum or an, another community, another blockchain community. And if you guys want it, the framing is way more forgiving than people think. I, I almost just want to say to the community, like, Hey, go give it a shot. Go, go like start talking to people, you know, in uh, cosmos community in, um, you know, other uh, crypto communities, um, especially ones where there's a lot of, there's, there's, there's two different types of people in the crypto world. You've got the builders and you've got the hype guys. And most uh, most communities are very much filled with a lot of the hype guys, but not so much the uh, builders. The builders became a very small percentage. 
there's a massive amount of builders within the Cosmos community and not quite as many hype guys. So the people who um, the people who are talking right now are people who they're very level headed. Uh, it's a very cooperative community because they just need more people present uh, in order for uh, mass adoption to kick in. So the the more you find communities that have that kind of sweet spot where they uh, they're in this collaboration mode, they want to be able to connect with you know other uh, audiences, uh, get more attention, all that stuff. That's a that's a massive sweet spot for a filmmaker to come in and say you know. I want to do this documentary or I want to do uh, I want to actually launch an IP Um, because that's the other thing, too, is there's lots of people out there who are trying to be the person who's going to launch that first uh, major NFT documentary. Um, And uh, uh, I've seen quite a few raise their hand and say, yep, uh, we're going to jump in. We're going to be the ones to do it. So. It's and, and listen, guys, if you want to get more information about blockchain and NFTs, I'll put the other episodes that I did uh, in the show notes as well, because they're they're plump full of a lot of information that we didn't cover. But uh, Arrow, man, I want to appreciate I appreciate you coming on the show. I'm going to ask you a couple questions. I ask all of my guests. Um, sure. What is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? Mm. Uh, the lesson that took me the longest to learn, probably. Um, I'm a slow learner, uh, so uh, it's probably more to do with uh, patience and planning uh, because I tend to like to just jump straight in um, and not take my time, taking that time in pre-production, in uh, setting uh, uh, methodical goals, probably planning. And three of your favorite films of all time. Ooh. Um, So uh, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, massive one. Um, I would say this is kind of funny cause it's like a completely different type of film, but Incredibles, no, like if I, fantastic, somebody fantastic asked me, film. somebody asked me, what is the film that you've watched like 12 times? The first Incredibles movie. I have no. watched that so many freaking times. <laughs> and so I have to include it. Cause it's sure, like, sure, sure. It's a great times. film. Great film. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the third one, I would say, um, Hmm, this one's tough. Um, there's a lot of good ones, but I'm just going to be kind of like basic and I'll say, uh, inception because okay. uh, I felt like that movie, uh, ah, no, I'm taking it back. Sorry, inception. You don't get it. You don't get it. Um, grand Budapest hotel because okay. that movie, I was just about to say that inception was like, uh, Christopher Nolan's like, that was what put it all together for like a lot of things that he was, a lot of tropes he was trying to bring together. But Grand Budapest Hotel to a whole nother level love with that. Wes Anderson. So. I love Grand yeah. Budapest Hotel. That was a great, great film. Brother, man, I appreciate you coming on, man. Continue success in the in the wild, wild west that is the NFT space. And Thank you, sir. And, uh, and please, if uh, if you raise – if let me know how this goes, man. I want to see where this goes. So let Absolutely. me know. If, if, you, if you're pulling in 10, 15, 20 mil, let me know. <laughs> I want, it. I want yes, that sir. success. I want that success story to come back on the show. So yes, I, sir. Absolutely. Yeah, I appreciate you, talk, brother. Well, let's talk, let's talk in uh, – Maybe three months, actually. (laughs) (laughs) That would be an amazing conversation. I appreciate you, brother. All right. I appreciate you, too.